A Clergyman's Daughter by George Orwell. This book consists of 320 pages and is in five chapters. Chapter 1 Part 1 As the alarm clock on the chest of drawers exploded like a horrid little bomb of bell metal, Dorothy, wrenched from the depths of some complex, troubling dream, awoke with a start and lay on her back, looking into the darkness in extreme exhaustion. The alarm clock continued its nagging, feminine clamour, which would go on for five minutes or thereabouts if you did not stop it. Dorothy was aching from head to foot, an insidious and contemptible self-pity which usually seized upon her when it was time to get up in the morning caused her to bury her head under the bedclothes and try to shut the hateful noise out of her ears. She struggled against her fatigue, however, and according to her custom, exhorted herself sharply in the second person plural. Come on, Dorothy, up you get. No snoozing, please. Proverbs 6, 9. Then she remembered that if the noise went on any longer, it would wake her father, and with a hurried movement, she bounded out of bed, seized the clock from the chest of drawers, and turned off the alarm. It was kept on the chest of drawers precisely in order that she should have to get out of bed to silence it. Still in darkness, she knelt down at her bedside and repeated the Lord's Prayer, but rather distractedly, her feet being troubled by the cold. It was just half-past five and coldish for an August morning. Dorothy, her name was Dorothy Hare, and she was the only child of the Reverend Charles Hare, rector of St. Athelstan's Knipe Hill, Suffolk, put on her aged flannelette dressing gown and felt her way downstairs. There was a chill morning smell of dust, damp plaster, and the fried dabs from yesterday's supper, and from either side of the passage on the second floor she could hear the antiphonal snoring of her father and of Ellen, the maid of all work. With care, for the kitchen table had a nasty trick of reaching out of the darkness and banging you on the hip bone, Dorothy felt her way into the kitchen, lighted the candle on the mantelpiece, and still aching with fatigue, knelt down and raked the ashes out of the range. The kitchen fire was a beast to light. The chimney was crooked and therefore perpetually half-choked, and the fire, before it would light, expected to be dosed with a cupful of kerosene, like a drunkard's morning nip of gin. Having set the kettle to boil for her father's shaving water, Dorothy went upstairs and turned on her bath. Ellen was still snoring with heavy, youthful snores. She was a good, hard-working servant once she was awake, but she was one of those girls whom the devil and all his angels cannot get out of bed before seven in the morning. Dorothy filled the bath as slowly as possible. The splashing always woke her father if she turned on the tap too fast, and stood for a moment regarding the pale, unappetizing pool of water. Her body had gone goose flesh all over. She detested cold baths. It was for that very reason that she made it a rule to take all her baths cold from April to November. Putting a tentative hand into the water, and it was horribly cold, she drove herself forward with her usual exhortations. Come on, Dorothy, in you go, no funking, please. Then she stepped resolutely into the bath, sat down, and let the icy girdle of water slide up her body and immerse her all except her hair, which she had twisted up behind her head. The next moment she came to the surface gasping and wriggling and had no sooner got her breath back than she remembered her memo list, which she had brought down in her dressing gown pocket and intended to read. She reached out for it and, leaning over the side of the bath, waist deep in icy water, read through the memo list by the light of the candle on the chair. It ran, Seven o'clock, H.C. Mrs. T. Baby must visit. Breakfast, bacon. Must ask father money. P. Ask Ellen what stuff kitchen father's tonic N.B. to ask about stuff for curtains at Soul Pipes. Visiting call on Mrs. P. Cutting from Daily M. Angelica T. Good for Rheumatism, Mrs. L.'s Corn Plaster. Twelve o'clock. Rehearsal, Charles I. N.B. to order half pound of glue, one pot of aluminium paint. Dinner, crossed out. Luncheon, take round parish mag N.B., Mrs. F. owes three and sixpence. 4.30 p.m., mother's U.T., don't forget two and a half yards, casement cloth. Flowers for church N.B., one tin brasso, supper scrambled eggs. Type father's sermon, what about new ribbon typewriter N.B., to fork between peas, bindweed, awful. 
Dorothy got out of her bath, and as she dried herself with a towel hardly bigger than a table napkin, they could never afford decent-sized towels at the rectory, her hair came unpinned and fell down over her collarbones in two heavy strands. It was thick, fine, exceedingly pale hair, and it was perhaps as well that her father had forbidden her to bob it, for it was her only positive beauty. For the rest, she was a girl of middle height, rather thin, but strong and shapely, and her face was her weak point. It was a thin, blonde, unremarkable kind of face, with pale eyes and a nose just a shade too long. If you looked closely, you could see crow's feet round the eyes, and the mouth, when it was in repose, looked tired. Not definitely a spinsterish face as yet, but it certainly would be so in a few years' time. Nevertheless, strangers commonly took her to be several years younger than her real age. She was not quite twenty-eight, because of the expression of almost childish earnestness in her eyes. Her left forearm was spotted with tiny red marks, like insect bites. Dorothy put on her nightdress again and cleaned her teeth, plain water, of course. Better not to use toothpaste before H.C., after all, either you are fasting or you aren't. The R.C.s are quite right there, and even as she did so, suddenly faltered and stopped. She put her toothbrush down. A deadly pang, an actual physical pang, had gone through her viscera. She had remembered with the ugly shock with which one remembers something disagreeable for the first time in the morning, the bill at Cargill's, the butcher's, which had been owing for seven months. That dreadful bill, it might be nineteen pounds or even twenty, and there was hardly the remotest hope of paying it, was one of the chief torments of her life. At all hours of the night or day, it was waiting just round the corner of her consciousness, ready to spring upon her and agonize her. And with it came the memory of a score of lesser bills mounting up to a figure of which she dared not even think. Almost involuntarily, she began to pray. Please, God, let not Cargill send in his bill again today but the next moment she decided that this prayer was worldly and blasphemous, and she asked forgiveness for it. Then she put on her dressing gown and ran down to the kitchen in hopes of putting the bill out of mind. The fire had gone out as usual. Dorothy relayed it, dirtying her hands with cold dust, dosed it afresh with kerosene and hung about anxiously until the kettle boiled. Father expected his shaving water to be ready at a quarter past six. Just seven minutes late, Dorothy took the can upstairs and knocked at her father's door. "'Come in, come in,' said a muffled, irritable voice. The room, heavily curtained, was stuffy with a masculine smell. The rector had lighted the candle on his bed table and was lying on his side looking at his gold watch, which he had just drawn from beneath his pillow. His hair was as white and thick as thistledown. One dark, bright eye glanced irritably over his shoulder at Dorothy. "'Good morning, Father.' "'I do wish, Dorothy,' said the rector indistinctly. His voice always sounded muffled and senile until he had put his false teeth in. "'You'll make some effort to get Ellen out of bed in the mornings, "'or else be a little more punctual yourself.' "'I'm so sorry, Father. The kitchen fire kept going out.' "'Very well. Put it down on the dressing table. "'Put it down and draw those curtains.' It was daylight now, but a dull, clouded morning. Dorothy hastened up to her room and dressed herself with the lightning speed which she found necessary six mornings out of seven. There was only a tiny square of mirror in the room, and even that she did not use. She simply hung her gold cross about her neck, plain gold cross, no crucifixes, please, twisted her hair into a knot behind, stuck a number of hairpins rather sketchily into it, and threw her clothes, grey jersey, threadbare Irish tweed coat and skirt, stockings not quite matching the coat and skirt, and much worn brown shoes, onto herself in the space of about three minutes. She had got to do out the dining room and her father's study before church, besides saying her prayers in preparation for Holy Communion, which took her not less than twenty minutes. When she wheeled her bicycle out at the front gate, the morning was still overcast, and the grass sodden with heavy dew. Through the mist that wreathed the hillside, St. Athelstan's church loomed dimly like a leaden sphinx, its single bell tolling funereally, boom, boom, boom. Only one of the bells was now in active use. The other seven had been unswung from their cage and had lain silent these three years past, slowly splintering the floor of the belfry beneath their weight. 
In the distance from the mists below, you could hear the offensive clatter of the bell in the R.C. church, a nasty, cheap, tinny little thing which the rector of St. Athelstan's used to compare to a muffin bell. Dorothy mounted her bicycle and rode swiftly up the hill, leaning over her handlebars. The bridge of her thin nose was pink in the morning cold. A red shank whistled overhead, invisible against the clouded sky. Early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Dorothy propped her bicycle against the lich gate, and finding her hands still grey with coal dust, knelt down and scrubbed them clean in the long wet grass between the graves. Then the bell stopped ringing, and she jumped up and hastened into church, just as Proggett, the sexton, in ragged cassock and vast labourer's boots, was clumping up the aisle to take his place at the side altar. The church was very cold, with a scent of candle wax and ancient dust. It was a large church, much too large for its congregation, and ruinous and more than half empty. The three narrow islands of pews stretched barely halfway down the nave, and beyond them were great wastes of bare stone floor in which a few worn inscriptions marked the sites of ancient graves. The roof over the chancel was sagging visibly. Beside the church, expenses box, two fragments of riddled beam explained mutely that this was due to that mortal foe of Christendom, the Death Watch Beetle. The light filtered, pale coloured, through windows of anemic glass. Through the open south door you could see a ragged cypress and the boughs of a lime tree, greyish in the sunless air and swaying faintly. As usual, there was only one other communicant, old Miss Mayfield of the Grange. The attendance at Holy Communion was so bad that the rector could not even get any boys to serve him except on Sunday mornings, when the boys liked showing off in front of the congregation in their cassocks and surplices. Dorothy went into the pew behind Miss Mayfield, and in penance for some sin of yesterday, pushed away the hassock and knelt on the bare stones. The service was beginning. The rector, in cassock and short linen surplice, was reciting the prayers in a swift, practised voice, clear enough now that his teeth were in, and curiously ungenial. In his fastidious, aged face, pale as a silver coin, there was an expression of aloofness, almost of contempt. This is a valid sacrament, he seemed to be saying, and it is my duty to administer it to you, but remember that I am only your priest, not your friend. As a human being, I dislike you and despise you. Proggett, the sexton, a man of forty with curly grey hair and a red, harassed face, stood patiently by, uncomprehending but reverent, fiddling with the little communion bell which was lost in his huge red hands. Dorothy pressed her fingers against her eyes. She had not yet succeeded in concentrating her thoughts. Indeed, the memory of Cargill's bill was still worrying her intermittently. The prayers, which she knew by heart, were flowing through her head unheeded. She raised her eyes for a moment, and they began immediately to stray, first upwards to the headless roof angels on whose necks you could still see the sore cuts of the Puritan soldiers, then back again to Miss Mayfield's black, quasi-pork pie hat and tremulous jet earrings. Miss Mayfield wore a long, musty black overcoat with a little collar of greasy-looking astrakhan, which had been the same ever since Dorothy could remember. It was of some very peculiar stuff, like watered silk, but coarser, with rivulets of black piping wandering all over it in no discoverable pattern. It might even have been that legendary and proverbial substance, black bombazine. Miss Mayfield was very old, so old that no one remembered her as anything but an old woman. A faint scent radiated from her, an ethereal scent, analyzable as eau de cologne, mothballs, and a subflavor of gin. Dorothy drew a long glass-headed pin from the lapel of her coat and furtively, under cover of Miss Mayfield's back, pressed the point against her forearm. Her flesh tingled apprehensively. She made it a rule, whenever she caught herself not attending to her prayers, to prick her arm hard enough to make blood come. It was her chosen form of self-discipline, her guard against irreverence and sacrilegious thoughts. With the pin poised in readiness, she managed for several moments to pray more collectedly. Her father had turned one dark eye disapprovingly upon Miss Mayfield, who was crossing herself at intervals, a practice he disliked. A starling chattered outside. With a shock, Dorothy discovered that she was looking vaingloriously at the pleats of her father's surplice, which she herself had sewn two years ago. 
She set her teeth and drove the pin an eighth of an inch into her arm. They were kneeling again. It was the general confession. Dorothy recalled her eyes, wandering, alas, yet again, this time to the stained glass window on her right, designed by Sir Ward Took, A.R.A., in 1851, and representing St. Athelstan's welcome at the gate of heaven by Gabriel and a legion of angels, all remarkably like one another, and the prince consort, and pressed the pinpoint against a different part of her arm. She began to meditate conscientiously upon the meaning of each phrase of the prayer, and so brought her mind back to a more attentive state. But even so, she was all but obliged to use the pin again when Proggett tinkled the bell in the middle of Therefore with Angels and Archangels, being visited, as always, by a dreadful temptation to begin laughing at that passage. It was because of a story her father had told her once of how, when he was a little boy and serving the priest at the altar, the communion bell had had a screw-on clapper, which had come loose. And so the priest had said, Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Screw it up, you little fathead, screw it up. As the rector finished the consecration, Miss Mayfield began to struggle to her feet with extreme difficulty and slowness, like some disjointed wooden creature picking itself up by sections and disengaging at each movement a powerful whiff of mothballs. There was an extraordinary creaking sound from her stays, presumably, but it was a noise as of bones grating against one another. You could have imagined that there was only a dry skeleton inside the black overcoat. Dorothy remained on her feet a moment longer. Miss Mayfield was creeping towards the altar with slow, tottering steps. She could barely walk, but she took bitter offence if you offered to help her. In her ancient, bloodless face, her mouth was surprisingly large, loose and wet. The underlip, pendulous with age, slobbered forward, exposing a strip of gum and a row of false teeth as yellow as the keys of an old piano. On the upper lip was a fringe of dark, dewy moustache. It was not an appetising mouth, not the kind of mouth that you would like to see drinking out of your cup. Suddenly, spontaneously, as though the devil himself had put it there, the prayer slipped from Dorothy's lips. Oh, God, let me not have to take the chalice after Miss Mayfield. The next moment, in self-horror, she grasped the meaning of what she had said and wished that she had bitten her tongue in two rather than utter that deadly blasphemy upon the very altar steps. She drew the pin again from her lapel and drove it into her arm so hard that it was all she could do to suppress a cry of pain. Then she stepped to the altar and knelt down meekly on Miss Mayfield's left so as to make quite sure of taking the chalice after her. Kneeling, with head bent and hands clasped against her knees, she set herself swiftly to pray for forgiveness before her father should reach her with the wafer. But the current of her thoughts had been broken. Suddenly it was quite useless attempting to pray. Her lips moved, but there was neither heart nor meaning in her prayers. She could hear Proggett's boots shuffling and her father's clear low voice murmuring, Take and eat. She could see the worn strip of red carpet beneath her knees. She could smell dust and odour cologne and mothballs. But of the body and blood of Christ, of the purpose for which she had come here, she was as though deprived of the power to think. A deadly blankness had descended upon her mind. It seemed to her that actually she could not pray. She struggled, collected her thoughts, uttered mechanically the opening phrases of a prayer, but they were useless, meaningless, nothing but the dead shells of words. Her father was holding the wafer before her in his shapely, aged hand. He held it between finger and thumb fastidiously, somehow distastefully, as though it had been a spoon of medicine. His eye was upon Miss Mayfield, who was doubling herself up like a geometrid caterpillar, with many creakings and crossing herself so elaborately that one might have imagined that she was sketching a series of braid frogs on the front of her coat. For several seconds Dorothy hesitated and did not take the wafer. She dared not take it. Better, far better to step down from the altar than to accept the sacrament with such chaos in her heart. Then it happened that she glanced sidelong through the open south door. A momentary spear of sunlight had pierced the clouds. It struck downwards through the leaves of the limes, and a spray of leaves in the doorway gleamed with a transient matchless green, greener than jade or emerald or Atlantic waters. It was as though some jewel of unimaginable splendor had flashed for an instant, filling the doorway with green light and then faded. 
A flood of joy ran through Dorothy's heart. The flash of living color had brought back to her, by a process deeper than reason, her peace of mind, her love of God, her power of worship. Somehow, because of the greenness of the leaves, it was again possible to pray. O oh, all ye green things upon the earth, praise ye the Lord. She began to pray ardently, joyfully, thankfully. The wafer melted upon her tongue. She took the chalice from her father and tasted without repulsion, even with an added joy in this small act of self-abasement, the wet imprint of Miss Mayfield's lips on its silver rim. Part Two St. Athelstan's church stood at the highest point of Nipe Hill, and if you chose to climb the tower, you could see ten miles or so across the surrounding country. Not that there was anything worth looking at, only the low, barely undulating East Anglian landscape, intolerably dull in summer, but redeemed in winter by the recurring pattern of the elms, naked and fan-shaped against leaden skies. Immediately below you lay the town, with the high street running east and west and dividing it unequally. The southern section of the town was the ancient, agricultural, and respectable section. On the northern side were the buildings of the Bliffel Gordon Sugar Beet Refinery, and all round and leading up to them were higgledy-piggledy rows of vile yellow brick cottages mostly inhabited by the employees of the factory. The factory employees, who made up more than half of the town's 2,000 inhabitants, were newcomers, town folk, and godless almost to a man. The two pivots, or foci, about which the social life of the town moved were the Knipe Hill Conservative Club, fully licensed, from whose bow window, any time after the bar was open, the large, rosy gilled faces of the town's elite were to be seen gazing like chubby goldfish from an aquarium pane, and ye old tea shop, a little farther down the high street, the principal rendezvous of the Knipe Hill ladies. Not to be present at ye old tea shop between ten and eleven every morning to drink your morning coffee and spend your half hour or so in that agreeable twitter of upper middle class voices. My dear, he had nine spades to the ace queen and he went one no trump, if you please. What, my dear, you don't mean to say you're paying for my coffee again. Oh, but my dear, it is simply too sweet of you. Now tomorrow I shall simply insist upon paying for yours. And just look at dear little Toto sitting up and looking such a clever little man with his little black nose wiggling. And he would, would he, the darling duck, he would, he would, and his mother would give him a lump of sugar. She would, she would. There, Toto, was to be definitely out of Knipe Hill society. The rector, in his acid way, nicknamed these ladies the Coffee Brigade. Close to the colony of sham picturesque villas inhabited by the coffee brigade, but cut off from them by its larger grounds, was the Grange, Miss Mayfield's house. It was a curious, machicolated imitation castle of dark red brick, somebody's folly, built about 1870, and fortunately almost hidden among dense shrubberies. The rectory stood halfway up the hill with its face to the church and its back to the high street. It was a house of the wrong age, inconveniently large and faced with chronically peeling yellow plaster. Some earlier rector had added at one side a large greenhouse which Dorothy used as a workroom, but which was constantly out of repair. The front garden was choked with ragged fir trees and a great spreading ash which shadowed the front rooms and made it impossible to grow any flowers. There was a large vegetable garden at the back. Proggett did the heavy digging of the garden in the spring and autumn, and Dorothy did the sowing, planting, and weeding in such spare time as she could command, in spite of which the vegetable garden was usually an impenetrable jungle of weeds. Dorothy jumped off her bicycle at the front gate, upon which some officious person had stuck a poster inscribed, Vote for Bliffill Gordon and Higher Wages. There was a by-election going on, and Mr. Bliffill Gordon was standing in the conservative interest. As Dorothy opened the front door, she saw two letters lying on the worn coconut mat. One was from the rural dean, and the other was a nasty, thin-looking letter from Catkin and Palm, her father's clerical tailors. It was a bill, undoubtedly. The rector had followed his usual practice of collecting the letters that interested him and leaving the others. Dorothy was just bending down to pick up the letters when she saw, with a horrid shock of dismay, an unstamped envelope sticking in the letter flap. It was a bill for certain it was a bill. Moreover, as soon as she set eyes on it, she knew that it was that horrible bill from Cargill's The Butchers. A sinking feeling passed through her entrails. 
For a moment, she actually began to pray that it might not be Cargill's bill, that it might only be the bill for three and nine from Soul Pipes, the Drapers, or the bill from the International, or the Bakers, or the Dairy. Anything except Cargill's bill. Then, mastering her panic, she took the envelope from the letter flap and tore it open with a convulsive movement. To account rendered twenty-one pounds, seven shillings and ninepence. This was written in the innocuous handwriting of Mr. Cargill's accountant. But underneath, in thick, accusing-looking letters, was added and heavily underlined. She'd like to bring to your notice that this bill has been owing a very long time. The earliest possible settlement will oblige. S. Cargill. Dorothy had turned a shade paler and was conscious of not wanting any breakfast. She thrust the bill into her pocket and went into the dining room. It was a smallish, dark room, badly in need of repapering, and like every other room in the rectory, it had the air of having been furnished from the sweepings of an antique shop. The furniture was good, but battered beyond repair, and the chairs were so worm-eaten that you could only sit on them in safety if you knew their individual foibles. There were old, dark, defaced steel engravings hanging on the walls, one of them an engraving of Van Dyck's portrait of Charles I, probably of some value, if it had not been ruined by damp. The rector was standing before the empty grate, warming himself at an imaginary fire and reading a letter that came from a long blue envelope. He was still wearing his cassock of black watered silk, which set off to perfection his thick white hair and his pale, fine, none too amiable face. As Dorothy came in, he laid the letter aside, drew out his gold watch, and scrutinized it significantly. I'm afraid I'm a bit late, Father. Yes, Dorothy, you are a bit late, said the rector, repeating her words with delicate but marked emphasis. You are twelve minutes late, to be exact. Don't you think, Dorothy, that when I have to get up at a quarter past six to celebrate Holy Communion and come home exceedingly tired and hungry, it would be better if you could manage to come to breakfast without being a bit late. It was clear that the rector was in what Dorothy called euphemistically his uncomfortable mood. He had one of those weary, cultivated voices which are never definitely angry and never anywhere near good humour. One of those voices which seem all the while to be saying... I really cannot see what you are making all this fuss about. The impression he gave was of suffering perpetually from other people's stupidity and tiresomeness. I'm so sorry, Father. I simply had to go and ask after Mrs. Tawney. Mrs. Tawney was the Mrs. T of the memo list. Her baby was born last night, and you know she promised me she'd come and be churched after it was born. But of course, she won't if she thinks we aren't taking any interest in her. You know what these women are... They seem so to hate being churched. They'll never come unless I coax them into it. The rector did not actually grunt, but he uttered a small dissatisfied sound as he moved towards the breakfast table. It was intended to mean, first, that it was Mrs. Tawney's duty to come and be churched without Dorothy's coaxing, secondly, that Dorothy had no business to waste her time visiting all the riffraff of the town, especially before breakfast. Mrs. Tawney was a labourer's wife and lived in Partibus in Videlium, north of the High Street. The rector laid his hand on the back of his chair and, without speaking, cast Dorothy a glance, which meant, Are we ready now, or are there to be any more delays? I think everything's here, Father, said Dorothy. Perhaps if you just say grace. Benedictus Benedicat, said the rector, lifting the worn silver coverlet off the breakfast dish. The silver coverlet, like the silver-gilt marmalade spoon, was a family heirloom. The knives and forks and most of the crockery came from Woolworth's. Bacon again, I see, the rector added, eyeing the three-minute rashers that lay curled up on squares of fried bread. It's all we've got in the house, I'm afraid, Dorothy said. The rector picked up his fork between finger and thumb, and with a very delicate movement, as though playing at spillikins, turned one of the rashers over. I know, of course, he said. The bacon for breakfast is an English institution almost as old as parliamentary government, but still, don't you think we might occasionally have changed, Dorothy? Bacon's so cheap now, said Dorothy regretfully. It seems a sin not to buy it. This was only five pence a pound, and I saw some quite decent-looking bacon as low as threepence. Ah, Danish, I suppose. What a variety of Danish invasions we have had in this country first with fire and sword, 
and now with their abominable cheap bacon, which has been responsible for the more deaths, I wonder. Feeling a little better after this witticism, the rector settled himself in his chair and made a fairly good breakfast off the despised bacon, while Dorothy, she was not having any bacon this morning, a penance she had set herself yesterday for saying damn and idling for half an hour after lunch, meditated upon a good conversational opening. There was an unspeakably hateful job in front of her, a demand for money. At the very best of times, getting money out of her father was next door to impossible, and it was obvious that this morning he was going to be even more difficult than usual. Difficult was another of her euphemisms. He's had bad news, I suppose, she thought despondently, looking at the blue envelope. Probably no one who had ever spoken to the rector for as long as ten minutes would have denied that he was a difficult kind of man. The secret of his almost unfailing ill humour really lay in the fact that he was an anachronism. He ought never to have been born into the modern world. Its whole atmosphere disgusted and infuriated him. A couple of centuries earlier, a happy pluralist, writing poems or collecting fossils while curates at forty pounds a year administered his parishes, he would have been perfectly at home. Even now, if he had been a richer man, he might have consoled himself by shutting the twentieth century out of his consciousness. But to live in past ages is very expensive. You can't do it on less than two thousand a year. The rector, tethered by his poverty to the age of Lenin and the Daily Mail, was kept in a state of chronic exasperation, which it was only natural that he should work off on the person nearest to him, usually, that is, on Dorothy. He had been born in 1871, the younger son of the younger son of a baronet, and had gone into the church for the outmoded reason that the church is the traditional profession for younger sons. His first cure had been in a large, slummy parish in East London, a nasty, hooliganish place it had been, and he looked back on it with loathing. Even in those days, the lower classes, as he made a point of calling them, were getting decidedly out of hand. It was a little better when he was curate in charge at some remote place in Kent. Dorothy had been born in Kent, where the decently downtrodden villagers still touched their hats to Parson. But by that time he had married, and his marriage had been diabolically unhappy. Moreover, because clergymen must not quarrel with their wives, its unhappiness had been secret and therefore ten times worse. He had come to Knipe Hill in 1908, aged 37, and with a temper incurably soured, a temper which had ended by alienating every man, woman, and child in the parish. It was not that he was a bad priest, merely as a priest. In his purely clerical duties, he was scrupulously correct, perhaps a little too correct for a low-church East Anglian parish. He conducted his services with perfect taste, preached admirable sermons, and got up at uncomfortable hours in the morning to celebrate Holy Communion every Wednesday and Friday. But that a clergyman has any duties outside the four walls of the church was a thing that had never seriously occurred to him. Unable to afford a curate, he left the dirty work of the parish entirely to his wife, and after her death, she died in 1921, to Dorothy. People used to say, spitefully and untruly, that he would have let Dorothy preach his sermons for him if it had been possible. The lower classes had grasped from the first what was his attitude towards them, and if he had been a rich man, they would probably have licked his boots according to their custom. As it was, they merely hated him. Not that he cared whether they hated him or not, for he was largely unaware of their existence. But even with the upper classes, he had got on no better. With the county, he had quarrelled one by one, and as for the petty gentry of the town, as the grandson of a baronet, he despised them, and was at no pains to hide it. In twenty-three years, he had succeeded in reducing the congregation of St. Athelstan's from six hundred to something under two hundred. This was not solely due to personal reasons. It was also because the old-fashioned high Anglicanism to which the rector obstinately clung was of a kind to annoy all parties in the parish about equally. Nowadays, a clergyman who wants to keep his congregation has only two courses open to him. Either it must be Anglo-Catholicism, pure and simple, or rather pure and not simple, or he must be daringly modern and broad-minded and preach comforting sermons proving that there is no hell and all good religions are the same. The rector did neither. On the one hand, he had the deepest contempt for the Anglo-Catholic movement. It had passed over his head, leaving him absolutely untouched. Roman fever was his name for it. On the other hand, he was too high for the older members of his congregation. 
From time to time he scared them almost out of their wits by the use of the fatal word Catholic, not only in its sanctified place in the creeds, but also from the pulpit. Naturally, the congregation dwindled year by year, and it was the best people who were the first to go. Lord Pockthorne of Pockthorne Court, who owned a fifth of the county, Mr. Levis, the retired leather merchant, Sir Edward Hewson of Crabtree Hall, and such of the petty gentry as owned motor cars had all deserted St. Athelstan's. Most of them drove over on Sunday mornings to Milborough, five miles away. Milborough was a town of 5,000 inhabitants, and you had your choice of two churches, St. Edmund's and St. Wiedekind's. St. Edmund's was modernist, text from Blake's Jerusalem, blazoned over the altar, and communion wine out of liqueur glasses, and St. Wiedekind's was Anglo-Catholic, and in a state of perpetual guerrilla warfare with the bishop. But Mr. Cameron, the secretary of the Knipe Hill Conservative Club, was a Roman Catholic convert, and his children were in the thick of the Roman Catholic literary movement. They were said to have a parrot which they were teaching to say, Extra Ecclesiam Nulla Salas. In effect, no one of any standing remained true to St. Athelstan's, except Miss Mayfield of the Grange. Most of Miss Mayfield's money was bequeathed to the church, so she said. Meanwhile, she had never been known to put more than sixpence in the collection bag, and she seemed likely to go on living forever. The first ten minutes of breakfast passed in complete silence. Dorothy was trying to summon up courage to speak. Obviously, she had got to start some kind of conversation before raising the money question, but her father was not an easy man with whom to make small talk. At times, he would fall into such deep fits of abstraction that you could hardly get him to listen to you. At other times, he was all too attentive, listened carefully to what you said, and then pointed out rather wearily that it was not worth saying. Polite platitudes, the weather, and so forth generally moved him to sarcasm. Nevertheless, Dorothy decided to try the weather first. It's a funny kind of day, isn't it? She said, aware, even as she made it, of the inanity of this remark. What is funny? inquired the rector. Well, I mean, it was so cold and misty this morning, and now the sun's come out, and it's turned quite fine. Is there anything particularly funny about that? That was no good, obviously. He must have had bad news, she thought. She tried again. I do wish you'd come out and have a look at the things in the back garden sometime, Father. The runner beans are doing so splendidly. The pods are going to be over a foot long. I'm going to keep all the best of them for the harvest festival, of course. I thought it would look so nice if we decorated the pulpit with festoons of runner beans and a few tomatoes hanging in among them. This was a faux pas. The rector looked up from his plate with an expression of profound distaste. My dear Dorothy, he said sharply, is it necessary to begin worrying me about the harvest festival already? I'm sorry, Father, said Dorothy, disconcerted. I didn't mean to worry you. I just thought... Do you suppose, proceeded the rector, it is any pleasure to me to have to preach my sermon among festoons of runner beans? I'm not a greengrocer. It quite puts me off my breakfast to think of it. When is the wretched thing due to happen? It's September the 16th, Father. That's nearly a month hence. For heaven's sake, let me forget it a little longer. I suppose we must have this ridiculous business once a year to tickle the vanity of every amateur gardener in the parish, but don't let's think of it more than is absolutely necessary. The rector had, as Dorothy ought to have remembered, a perfect abhorrence of harvest festivals. He had even lost a valuable parishioner, a Mr. Togus, a surly retired market gardener, through his dislike, as he said, of seeing his church dressed up to imitate a coster's stall. 